Well, good morning or afternoon, I suppose, depending on where where you are tuning in from. Uh, you have arrived at the uh, uh, the webinar for today. I'm very excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, we're with Dr. Steve Rungi today. I'm going to take a minute and introduce him uh, in, in just a second. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if as we're going through here and Dr. Dr. Rungi is walking us through his, uh, his, his, uh, his scholarship, if you have any questions that you'd like to send his way, um, you can do that by email. You can send them to us at webinar at logos.com, webinar at logos.com. Uh, they'll come right into my inbox right here, and I can uh, I can I can ask them for you um, here on air. So if you have questions for Dr. Rungi, anything that uh, that we're talking about today, um, you can send them to webinar at logos.com. Uh, we do have a, a this is something uh, kind of exciting today. Uh, a special sale on uh, the Lexum Discourse products. Um, if you use the coupon code webinar today, you can save on um, all of the resources that Dr. Rungi is uh, uh, working through today. He's, uh, these, are, these are products that um, are it's a, the process of uh, his work and the work of his team uh, over several years, and they're really incredible. I use them on a very regular basis. Um, and he's gonna he's gonna show you the the process behind each of them and and uh, the purpose and process behind each of them and um, uh, then uh, if you'd like to add those to your library you can do that uh, and use the coupon code webinar when you check out and you'll save fifteen percent on each of those. Um, we're going to spend about an hour together today, um, uh, and if after this webinar you'd like to go back and review um, something that Dr. Rungi was talking about, you'd like to rewatch, you'd like to show someone, you can do that. We store all of our um, training webinars at this address, logos.com slash webinar hyphen archive. Um, all of our previous training events are stored there. Uh, this one will be there um, sometime tomorrow. Um, and if you register for this event, we'll send you a link to the recording after the fact so that you can review it um, at your own pace. Uh, well, um, many of you know Dr. Rungi, um, uh, but if you don't, um, I'd like to take a minute just to tell you a little bit about him. Um, Dr. Rungi is a scholar in residence here at Faith Life. Um, and he is uh, an expert in uh, discourse. And if you hear that word and don't know what it means, uh, you are in the right place because he's going to take some time today to explain it to you. Um, discourse is a um, is a study that um, uh, it's a shame. Uh, you, you know, you ha you have to go to seminary to learn about it, and even then, you probably won't learn anything about it until your third or fourth year of seminary. And, and Dr. Rungi is an expert expert in the. Uh, the study, the practice of, of discourse scholarship. And he has taken his expertise and applied it to um, uh, using the, the technology um, of Logos Bible software and applied it to um, uh, the New Testament. And uh, the result is an incredible suite of tools um, that uh, uh, it's really it's changed the way that I uh, read the New Testament, the way that I study and, and read my Bible. So I am um, just uh, uh, thrilled uh, that we were able to get him to, to spend an hour with us talking about his process and the, the, the purpose and the intent behind um, his products, like the High Definition Commentary, um, the High Definition New Testament. So this is going to be a fun a fun day. And you're going next week, you're at, you're at Oxford, Oxford, you said? No. Uh... I will be going on a trip this summer. This summer, weekend. okay. Yeah, this summer. From... So this is this is this is content. What he's talking about today is content. He he lectures on all over the world. Southern Seminary, Dallas Seminary. This summer, headed to the UK to speak at Oxford about it. So um, this is uh, really a treat uh, for us. So without further ado, uh, without any further ado, Dr. Rungi. Thanks a lot, Ray. Um, in leading up to this, I had some some people write in um, asking about the seminar in the, in the translation community. Some folks from CanIL and also some folks from Dallas, and they really deserve a hat tip. And in, in that, a lot of the research that I'm presenting on um, really derives from being mentored by a, a translator, um, Stephen Levinson. So. What we're going to be looking at is really the the fruit of of research that, that he and others have done, but applied to uh, 
exegesis, to study of the Bible instead of Bible translation. So there's overlap. And in fact, some of the folks working in Bible translation are using these resources to help help support translation. But we're going to be primarily focused on uh, Bible study today. Um, when, so in terms of um, how we normally do Bible study, most of us are going to be beginning with um, uh, an English or a Greek text where there's no, um, there's no real breakdown of any kind of, of other than paragraphing. You've got things divided into verses. So what we're going to be looking at today to kind of illustrate things is Philippians 1, um, that first paragraph, verses 3 to 10. Now, if we look at the Greek text, not saying that you necessarily know Greek, but in Greek, you have one long sentence. All of verses 3 through 7 are, are one sentence. And in fact, it actually goes down through 8. You can see the period here where in English, if we take a look at the ESV version, you see it actually is, is made up of three different sentences. Um, let you in a little secret. Greek is not English. There are mismatches between them. And so the goal... Uh, of our study is is not so much the translation, but to understand what's going on in Greek, and then to be able to to learn how to apply that ourselves, and then communicate that to the, the people that we're we're teaching. Now there are a lot of things like literary features and rhetorical devices and grammatical and syntactic devices that if you were to go to seminary, you could learn about, and they would help you. Um, understand the structuring of the information. They'd help you understand the prioritizing of the writer's message and, and what they've, um, what kind of steps they've taken. Um, but up to this point of, of, of prior to the discourse resources that I've been uh, privileged to work on, you really were on your own to go and learn those. You'd have to read the books and then come back to the the text and do your own analysis of them. And as I, as I was in seminary, I saw pastors who were struggling to learn those things. They they had problems learning, you know, memorizing all the words and memorizing the forms. I uh, on a couple of short term mission trips, I ran into church planters or national pastors, Bible translators, again, we're, we're struggling with that. And so one of the, kind of my mission in life as a result of, of seeing those challenges was to find some way of taking the specialized content that largely the Bible translation community and other linguists had found were very useful and to bring those back in and to kind of democratize those so that they were accessible to people who didn't necessarily have all of the background. And that's really the spirit behind the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament and the High Definition New Testament. Uh, these projects were, were really something of an experiment um, to see, could this be done? Could we take <clears throat> these kinds of projects, this kind of advanced information, and, and present it in a way that would be accessible? So let's kind of, if you look at the um, at these two screens here, you'll see that this isn't your standard paragraph wrapped text. There is a block end in outline. And what this does is the, the structuring and the prioritization and the, the syntactic structuring that the writers have done, whether you know Greek or not, you can see that. So we see at verse one, there's a sentence that begins, and then it, it has, as, as you indent the different levels, that's reflecting the dependency relationships that are going on in Greek that, again, if you had studied Greek, you had gotten through your second year, your third year, had done uh, additional reading, you'd be able to, to see that and know those kinds of things. But what we've done is, is actually reflected that in the typesetting of this resource. So you can see that you, you come all the way down to the end of verse 7 um, before you get to um, the next, you know, as so you can see that there's, the, the sentence that began up in verse 3 lines up in, in the left column with the sentence that's down at verse 8, or the support. Um, and what this does is this helps you understand more about the structure, even if you've not studied Greek, or especially uh, for those of you who have studied Greek, um, but it, it, it's gotten rusty. Um, and you're not as sharp as you were when you left seminary, and you're not going to go back for your DMAN or your THM. The goal of this resource is to help draw people back into a closer reading of Scripture. Um, 
and we've got symbols and things that, that may be new, but all you need to do um, is hover over any of these elements. So if it's the, the left column descriptions or whether it's um, looking at, at some of the, the markups that are on the text, you, all you need to do is hover on these and you'll get a pop-up glossary entry that comes with these resources. So the first big benefit of these resources is to give you a breakdown, kind of simplifying the structure, um, especially for those of you who, who don't have Greek and, and there are things that are lost in translation. So you look at the ESV, we've got a period here at the end of verse 5, we've got another one at the end of verse 6, and then finally one at verse 7 where in, in the Greek text it's all one long sentence. Again, we're not saying there's anything wrong with what ESV has done. Greek is not English. But the point is, is to be able to, to see what's going on in the Greek text in terms of the, the structuring and the syntactic decisions in a way that's accessible for, for non-specialists in English or in the, the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. Um, another thing that, uh, another kind of device that you'll find that there are um, rhetorical devices there are rhetorical devices that, again, if you did enough study in Greek, you could learn about. So uh, one of these things would be cataphoric demonstratives, if you were to, to have studied Greek. We have an example of this in verse 6, but we don't call it a, a cataphoric demonstrative. It's a forward-pointing reference and target. And these are things that we use all the time in English. If I'm <clears throat> wanting to uh, to, to to forecast or to telegraph something that's important that I'm about to say, I'd say, all right, here's my point, or this is what I want you to do, or, or here's my best offer, where here or this is referring ahead to what I'm about to say instead of doing what pronouns typically do, which is referring back to what I've already said. And so we've identified this rhetorical device where you've got the little arrow uh, on either side of the, the pronoun that's pointing forward, and then you've got a target on either side that's showing you what it's pointing forward to. Um, and again, Philippians 1.6 is, is one of these very popular uh, memory verses, and I'm sure of this. So in terms of translation, a colon would work really well there. I'm sure of this, colon, that he who began a good work in you uh, we'll bring it to completion in, at the day of Jesus Christ. So we've identified this rhetorical device where Paul's drawn attention to something, this important idea, which is the fact that, that God will complete this work that he's begun in us. And he's done that by drawing attention to it with this forward-pointing reference and target. And so what this resource does, both of these resources, you'll see that you've got the same kind of markup in the Greek text as well. What you're seeing in the ESV is not an, an, an analysis of the ESV, but it's actually an analysis of the Greek text. Um, what I did was uh, found the, the most um, fruitful and e easiest to understand devices and went through and annotated the Greek New Testament. So this is for those of you uh, Greek nerds out there, fellow Greek nerds, uh, the Nestle, uh, the Nestle Island um, 20, uh, 27th edition is what we've marked up. Um, and then we've used uh, the, the logos reverse interlinear alignment to bur to port probably 70% of that data. Some of the data doesn't work well in English, so it's it's not all been brought over, but the vast majority of it has been brought over. So what you're seeing is actually in in the ESV, in the in the HD and the, the high definition New Testament, you're seeing a markup of the Greek text but overlaid on the English on the English text, um, which is again something you, you you're not gonna have access to or find anywhere else. So both of these resources are going to help you understand um, the structuring of the text, the syntactic breakdown, the dependency relationships. We've looked at um, some of the rhetorical devices like this forward pointing reference and target. But you'll see that, that there are other things as well. So this double, uh, this double silhouette, a changed name. Um, so and notice that it's, it's talking about he who began a good work in you. Big question is, who is that? One of the, the kind of prime directives when you're speaking or writing is to make sure 
your, your hearer or reader can know who's doing what to whom. And typically we'll introduce someone um, and, and assign them a name. And once we've assigned them that name, you expect that they're going to stick with that unless there's some reason, because uh, otherwise potentially you'd, you'd lose people, uh, you'd lose people and, and have them not understand um, who you're referring to. So there's this risk in changing the expression. Um, the, the challenge is um, then was, uh, making sure people can maintain reference, but we will change references both in English and we see it in Greek and in many other languages. We'll change referring expressions quite often and it's, and it's for a, a rhetorical or, or literary reason. It's to accomplish an effect. And here, the he who began a good work in you is, is most likely God, perhaps Jesus, but it's, it's referring to a member of the Godhead. Um, and so the question is, well, why would Paul have referred to him as he who began a good work in you as opposed to calling him God? Well, what, what these changes of reference do is it, it forces us as readers or hearers, or at least it's directing us, it's the writer's directions to, to shape and constrain how we think about that person or that thing. And in this case, instead of thinking about God, which might evoke all kinds of different images as, as judge or creator, um, instead, um, Paul is constraining us to think about him as, as the one who began the good work in us. And why would he do it in, in this context? It's because of what he's about to say in the main sentence, which is, this this confidence we can have that he will bring it to completion so uh, as an analogy my mom uh, uh, when i was growing up would sometimes not call me steve she'd say will the person who left the peanut butter out on the counter please come down and put it away um, unfortunately I, I i'd like to say that i was this um, well-behaved kid, but not always. I had a lot to learn and I, I caused my mom some challenge. But the question is, why Why would she use this, this change of reference? Well, I knew who she was talking to and she knew who she was talking to. And what that did was it, it forced me to think about myself in a different way, not as Steve, not as her son, not as Renee's brother, but as the guy who left the peanut butter out on the counter. <clears throat> And that fit naturally with what she was telling me to come down and do, which was to clean up my mess and put things away. So we'll do these kinds of things. We'll make these kinds of shifts. And the purpose of this resource is to help you slow down and think about these same kinds of things. Now, if this sounds like a lot, the um, each of these resources come with a, a glossary. We've already seen the, the pop-up glossary. Um, but there is also an introduction. Um, so in the HDNT, the High Definition New Testament, um, there's, a, there's about a, a, I think it's a 30 or 40 page introduction in the Greek database. Um, it, it's about a 75 page introduction. And what it does is give you a basic introduction to the kind of the, the framework that we're using, how, how these ideas fit together about choice implying meaning, prominence and such. But then as you're actually working through the individual um, devices, there's a general thumbnail sketch, which is the glossary introduction, kind of an explanation of what does this look like? And then working through a couple examples to show you what we're talking about. Um, and the goal of these resources, the, 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 this, the metaphor of the high definition New Testament, when I was growing up, TV was changing. I think we first started with a black and white TV and then things changed to color. And, and then as an adult, the high definition televisions came out and it was, it was dramatic because all of a sudden you could see things that had always been there. It always been there. But you, you could see such clarity, such detail watching a golf, you know, watching a golf game. I wasn't into golf, but I just like seeing the, the, the amazing detail or, or in baseball. You could see blades of grass. You could see shadows. And, and that's the metaphor behind the high definition New Testament, calling it HDNT, is that these devices, the, the structuring devices, the rhetorical devices, the literary devices, they've always been there. And 
And that's why you see it reflected in the older grammarians from the turn of the century that, that saw these kinds of devices and talked about them, the translators, and, and you see reference to these things in the technical literature. Um, so it's not that I've, I've discovered something that's it's always been there. The point is, it's helping you see them in a way that's understandable and accessible. So in terms of, of, of kind of how these resources work, um, the the high definition New Testament comes with a glossary and the introduction. So there's a three volume bundle. If you're not afraid of Greek, uh, you can, there are interlinear, uh, interlinear lines you can turn off and on. So I've got the English literal gloss and that's the Lexham English Bible. So it's basically a very readable interlinear line. Um, it, it's meant so that you could read this. And, and so if you're not afraid of working with an interlinear, you can access all of the, the resources, all of the, um, the devices that are marked up. Because as I said, only about 70% of them were brought over into English because some of the changes in word order and things do not work well in, in English. And, and we, we left those out. So there's greater precision and clarity in the uh, Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. That also comes with a glossary and a more advanced introduction. Um, well, we've we've looked at at kind of how um, how these devices. So I've explained these devices to you, and you say, "Well, well gosh, I, I understand the forward pointing reference and target. That makes sense. I understand kind of change reference, but maybe you're saying, "Well, how does this fit together into?" Um, a kind of a unified reading of the text. How, what, what would this look like in, in the pulpit? Um, this is where the, the high definition commentary comes in. Uh, we've got uh, volumes on Philippians and Romans. Basically, uh, the president of the company, Bob Pritchett, came into my office one afternoon and, and said, Steve, you're really excited about uh, discourse analysis and linguistics and what this has to offer for people. Well, prove it write a commentary that my mom could use in her Bible study um, and and that would be accessible for people that would not dumb things down, but just simplify it to where they could really see the practical payoff that you're claiming is there. So this commentary is unique in that it's, it's based on a discourse analysis of the Greek text, but there are no footnotes and there are no Greek words. It's meant to be a, a, an accessible talking you through the flow of Paul's argument um, to help you see how the different pieces fit together, but it also features infographics that will help you see how the kinds of things we just talked about with the forward pointing reference, um, how they could be communicated to, uh, to a small group Bible study, or if you're, if you're preaching or teaching, um, to be able to have slides that you could use on a Sunday morning. So here we've got a slide that illustrates the forward pointing reference. Um, and all I need to do is right click on this, click on image, and I can send this to proclaim, to keynote, or to PowerPoint um, a, a professionally designed graphic um, that I can use in my, in my preaching or teaching. Um, and then again, as I talk about this idea of he who began a good work in you, that changed reference. Again, I, I kind of talk through metaphorically how there are all kinds of different ways we could think about God. Um, and, and so we think about, you know, the books about names of God and the different titles for God. Some of those things might come to mind, but by switching and changing the reference, Paul is narrowing down that potential list to one. And it's the one that he wants us to think about based on what he's about to say, which is that confidence that we can have that God will be faithful to complete that work he began in us. And if he had just called him God and said, God will complete the work that he began in you, that would have been a more simplified way of conveying the same content. But by using that change reference, it, it changes how we think about God in this context and, and makes it a much more memorable and a much more evocative kind of, of uh, verse and, and one that we're much more likely uh, to, to memorize. That's why I think it is such, uh, such a popular verse. Uh, now, when we, we ship the, uh, the high def, um, this first volume of the high definition commentary, uh, we did a survey of people to say, um, what did you think? And we had a very positive response. And that's what led then to going on to, to doing a, a volume on Romans. 
Um, so basically this, this high definition commentary will talk you through the kind of what is very complex argument that Paul's developed, uh, but it also features, features infographics that will help you better understand the text. And so again, popular verse now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed as attested by the law and the prophets. What we've done um, is taken all of the, the different details that Paul has provided, like being um, attested by the law and the prophets and kind of reflected in, in a modern way, um, like in terms of marketing, why would Paul have included these details? Well, it's to show you that, that it's gotten a thumbs up from the law and the prophets. And so, again, some, some kind of playful ways of helping people slow down and think about uh, the details. And then each of these slides has, uh, has a, a caption that basically would tell you, you know, if I'm preaching and I've used most of these slides in terms of teaching and preaching, uh, this is really reflecting the high def commentaries, reflecting how I would teach through the text in the Sunday school class. Uh, so it's going to help you not just in your own personal study, but potentially then in, in sharing that with others uh, where you have um, Greek ideas. So for those of you uh, Greek nerds, you know, the, the, the conjunction gar that's generally translated for, we don't, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for is the gospel or for is the, uh, uh, for in it, the, uh, for this, yeah, but anyway, we have this whole chain of fours, and in English, we don't use for in that way. We would use rhetorical questions. So we've reframed this development of thought in Romans 3.22 in a way that, that is more natural in English. Again, it's not to say that there's anything wrong or, or a problem with the translations. It's, it's helping people understand Greek on its own terms as Greek um, and so that you can do this kind of apples to apples comparison rather than trying to translate something that doesn't really fit as, as naturally in English. Um, one of the comments that, that came back um, was some of the after some of these early projects was people saying, I want to see more detail. I want to understand more how you got from A to B. And so that's where we've we've gone and added um, other materials so that the, the high definition New Testament, it's based on the ESV text. So that's the, the analysis of the Greek, um, the Greek text that's been ported over to the ESV. Um, the three volumes are the HDNT itself, the introduction, and the glossary. Um, we've also got a bundle that's the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. That's the Greek analysis, but it, you'll notice that it's six volumes, and that's because you get the glossary and, and introduction with it. But if you buy the Greek database, the, the HDNT comes along with that. It's all part of that um, in a bundle. Um, so if if you're not afraid to work with um, an interlinear text, um, and you want access to those additional details, then, then this might be a, a good option for you. Um, the high definition commentaries are basically taking that Greek analysis and moving it into the pulpit or into a teaching setting to give you ideas of, of how you could, uh, convey some of these complex rhetorical devices or literary devices, but more importantly, the, the text of the commentary talks you through the, the flow of the argument to help you understand um, and, and track what the writer's doing and to recognize how, where they've prioritized things or structured things um, to, to shape how we think about the text. Once the New Testament database was done, um, I took a summer and wrote a discourse grammar. And this grammar is being used in intermediate Greek classes uh, in some pretty significant seminaries, Southern Seminary, Southeastern, Dallas, uh, Southern, some of the schools overseas as well. Um, so this is, again, for those of you who have had Greek, this isn't something where you're going to be required to go back and relearn all your forms and all your morphology. This is designed to, to get you back into the text or for those that are um, looking for what am I going to do this summer to follow up after first year Greek. This is a great read um, and provides an accessible overview um, that goes beyond the introduction um, that you'd have in the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. It comes with footnotes and um, and also correlates these findings with the older grammarians. So this is a great way if you studied Greek, you're interested in grammar, to see how these how this 
kind of what looks like a new approach reconciles. It's actually, um, I, I demonstrate that the, the older grammarians were seeing the same things. They just lacked the framework to describe them. Um, but if you're interested in say, okay, I'd, I'd really like to, to get the, the database, the grammar, Philippians, there's a bundle, um, this nine volume uh, New Testament, uh, Greek New Testament discourse bundle, you'll get the high definition commentary, the, or the, the high definition New Testament, the Lexan discourse, Greek New Testament, the discourse grammar, and then the Philippians commentary. And then as well, there is a, a volume honoring my mentor, Stephen Levinson of SIL, um, that's also included in that. Um, we've been, uh, our team, our discourse team has, has expanded in the last couple of years, and we've actually just completed the Old Testament counterpart to the New Testament databases. So there's the Hebrew Bible analysis, um, and then there's an ESV version of the same. So it's it's using the same framework as the New Testament, uh, the same kinds of devices because we're using a cross-linguistic framework. It's not something that's idiosyncratic to Greek or English. So you'll see that you have a forward-pointing reference here, just as we saw in the New Testament, um, and it's marked up in the same way. So if, if you um, invest the time and energy to learn this approach in the New Testament, you, it's going to pay dividends in the Old Testament as well. So there is a bundle um, that's available that has the New Testament and the Old Testament resources all together. And if you end up um, in with Logo, Logos has dynamic pricing. So if you were to have bought the New Testament databases in this nine volume bundle, and then went on to buy this other bundle, you'd get credit and a discount then based on your purchase of the New Testament volumes. Um, if you go to uh, just, do a search on on Rungi at logos.com. It'll pull up other projects we're working on. The high definition commentary on James is is underway. I'm uh, as soon as I get out of here, I'll go back and and keep writing in chapter five. But that should be coming out this summer. We also have um, handbooks. People were saying uh, wanted to better understand how how we got from the Greek text into the high definition commentary. Because as I said, there are no footnotes, there's no reference to Greek. And the handbooks are designed to, to provide that additional detail, to talk you through that synthesis of the discourse features into this unified reading that you see in the high definition commentary. Very good. So just a couple of questions have come up um, as uh, as we're going through here. One uh, one viewer uh, has pointed out that uh, the uh, the outline layout in the high definition high definition New Testament looks a lot like the propositional flow feature in Logos six. If you're not familiar, Logos six includes a feature called propositional flow. Um, then the question is. Um, Dr. Rungi, how much were you involved in the creation of propositional flow? And is it the same data that, um, uh, uh, I guess, supports the propositional flow feature? Um, could you speak to, could you speak to that? Let's see, where we go. Here's proposition. So here's what the question was asking about. So this is the ESV text and then Lagos 6 in any, in any translation or text that's linked to an original language. Uh, to the SBLG and T, you can turn this on as a visual filter and get a breakdown. Um, I work uh, in my, my discourse team is housed in content innovation uh, in the content innovation department. And one of my colleagues, Mark, um, also in content innovation is the one who did the um, propositional um, propositional outlines. So it's, it's, it is quite similar, and in fact, you could say, I mean, it would be true to say that the High Definition New Testament outline is what inspired this. And you'll notice that it goes into more detail. So instead of just providing a generic label like sentence or subpoint, what its intention is, is to provide more, to, to tell you semantic, provide a, an additional description in terms of semantically what the relationship is. And so it's something that would be compatible um, and, and in, in a lot of respects, going into, into greater detail, um, but it's all based on the Greek text. Um, and Mark and I 
um, interacted quite a bit as he was working on this. I mean, it was his work. Um, so not to take anything away, but when he'd hit a wall, he'd come in, close my door, plunk down. I've got a nice overstuffed chair. So people come and visit and he, all right, what's going on with this? And we, we, we chug through it and try to figure it out. And in some cases he, he challenged me and, and that dialogue led to improvement of, of my analysis or it answer his question, but it, it should be something that would be compatible. It's compatible, but different. They have different tasks. Uh, my main goal was providing a basic outline in order to break down the structure so that it, with the attention being on the discourse devices that are marked up, where Mark's, the, the propositional outline is more focused on the structure itself and the relationship between the things. And that's why you don't see any additional markup in the text. Um, another viewer asked the question, uh, what are you working on next? I know you mentioned the uh, James, the high definition commentary in James that's uh, due out sometime this summer. Um, then, then what's next in the high definition commentary series? Um, if you look at the, the handbook bundle, the discourse handbook bundle, um, we are working toward, uh, well, Philippians and Romans are both uh, out in the high def commentaries. We're trying to catch the handbooks up so that basically as we ship a, ship a commentary, there would be a handbook to go with it or, or vice versa, you know, th that they'd come out closely together. So if you're preaching or teaching through a book, you could have the databases, you'd have the handbook um, to work through the detail and see what it looks like in the pulpit or in a teaching setting. So most likely the, the, the handbooks include, uh, it'll be Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, Colossians, um, and James. So I'm working with a colleague, Chris, uh, Chris Lyle, uh, that's the series editor for that. So part of my time is spent on that, but I will probably go into Colossians next. Um, but uh, there is a, a project um, that I've wanted to do. I told you about the, the discourse grammar of the Greek New Testament. This is, this is a technical book. It's an intermediate Greek grammar. It's something that doctoral students are using, that master's students are using. But a lot of these same ideas, again, they're reflected in the high definition New Testament. They're not brain surgery. I made it sound like it so that then people would think it was really academic and they'd read it. But it, it's not brain surgery. There is there is a, a different way of presenting the same content. And so I'm, I'm still prototyping. If you walked into my office, you'd see a whiteboard that's full of scribbles. But I would like to work on a book that would be a companion volume to the high definition New Testament. But instead of it being a discourse grammar and getting into technical things with lots of footnotes, it would be kind of a prequel and more along the lines of reading the New Testament in high definition, where it would be teaching you reading skills and how to, to step back and think about how and why we read, because that ultimately goes back to how God has wired us to process language as human beings. And that's why we can make these cross-linguistic descriptions about here's here's how we draw attention to the, these kinds of things in Greek. Here's how we draw attention to these kinds of things in Hebrew or in English. But functionally, we're talking about drawing attention to things, prioritizing things, um, structuring things. So this book would slow down and, and think about those, and, and, but it would be designed for someone who's using the high definition New Testament to get more out of that database. And again, an, an expansion of the introduction in some respects, because each of the introductions to the databases were the prequel to these kinds of book projects. The Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament was the prequel to the discourse grammar. Um, I want to come back and hopefully in this next year work on that volume um, the other volume that I'd like to work on that I've threatened to write at some point is moving from discourse grammar to discourse analysis. And again, that would be um, more for the technical Greek audience, but moving from kind of this lower level analysis of the features that we see here in the databases up to uh, a higher level analysis of the book. Um, something that would be kind of a more rigorous version of biblical theology, of, of the theology of a book, um, being able to work that out from the details that we have marked up here in the database. And one last question. Uh, one user is pointing out, you know, there's several options here. You were talking about a few different products, the high definition New Testament, which is, you know, the, the English first and then the um, Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament, which is Greek first and then the high definition commentaries, which sort of synthesize those things. 
if you were going to recommend somebody, somebody a, a, a pastor um, or, or a, a, a maybe a semi-professional Bible student, we'll put it that way, um, uh, if, if you were going to recommend one product for them to get started with, um, where what, what would you send them to? That's a good question. Um, it, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to see the practical payoff, what is this going to do for me in terms of comparing how I studied my Bible before and, and the kinds of results, I would encourage you to take a look at the, um, the high definition commentary, either Philippians or Romans. I mean, pick if, if one of those books, you know, well, get that one. Um, and what that's going to do then is challenge you. I mean, you're going to be able to see, was I, was I picking up on these kinds of things or not? And if you weren't, then you can decide, is it worth learning and investing and doing the reading of the HDNT introduction? And is it worth doing these kinds of things? And if, and if you find that, I mean, it's either going to push your buttons or it won't. Um, and, and if nothing else, it's going to help you understand Philippians better. Uh, but if, if, if you, uh, and, and there are samples of these available uh, up at the website. So down, I mean, you can go and, and download the first section of each book of, of the first part of Philippians 1, the first part of Romans 1. And again, it's either going to push your buttons and be what you're looking for, or, or it's not. Um, if, if you're into the, the high definition, the HDNT would be a place to start, but you're going to be more on your own in the synthesizing it. You could read the introduction and, and those kinds of things, but it's going to be more up to you to learn those things. And I'm going to be doing more. I'm committing myself this year to doing more and more kind of training in the sense of just talking through passages, like a little bit of like what we did today, but more focused on, working through the passages instead of talking about the products. The goal today was just to talk about where this came from and what it potentially has to offer for your Bible study. Um, but I would encourage you to do something with, you know, look at the, the high definition commentary to pull it all together. And again, if, if th that, if that is, is interesting to you, then you'll, you'll get a, a with dynamic pricing, you're not going to get penalized for buying one instead of buying the larger bundle. Absolutely. So would it be safe to say that the HDNT would be a good place to start for people who have a do-it-yourself sort of attitude and mentality and don't mind um, wrestling with it a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you, you know, if you're studying a book um, or, you know, there's a book you've worked through closely, um, I mean, I, I'd, I'd look at getting the, the Greek, especially if, I mean, if you're a close reader, if you're a Bible study fellowship or a precepts person, or again, you've had Greek somewhere in the past, I'd encourage you to look at getting the, the Greek and English bundle. And then you can have the, because the display you see here is how I teach. Um, I mean, when I'm teaching in a Greek setting, because then you can use sympathetic highlighting and see, you know, look at one thing on the Greek side and then see, well, how is this reflected in English? Um, and, and that way you can be looking at the granular detail, but then also see how it's reflected by the translators or open up the compare versions window on the side. Um, but that's going to be, if, if you're a, de you know, a detail person and you want to do this yourself, then I would certainly look at getting the, um, the Greek and the English databases. And you've got the introduction um, to read through in each of them. And you could begin with the HDNT introduction, which is much shorter, much more simplified. And then to kind of go on advanced, go on into the, the Lexing Discourse Greek New Testament introduction, which is basically twice the length. Excellent. Well, very good. Um, and reminder, we talked about this up at the top, but uh, if uh, these, uh, if you'd like to add any of these resources to your library, either the HD NT, the uh, Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament, or the High Definition Commentaries, or the bundle that includes all of those things, um, uh, use the coupon code WEBINAR when you check out, and you will save 15%. Uh, on all of those products. Well, um, it's been uh, it's been a, a great a great time together. Um, we'll have the recording ready for you here in the next day or so, and and send an email that that it has a, a link to it um, so that you can review uh, this at your own pace. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time.